Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos. And today I'm out on Pulaski Highway and if you can read the sign behind me, it is a, a sign for the entrance to the Harbor Tunnel or Harbor Tunnel Thruway. On November 29th, 1957, Governor Theodore McKeldin, presiding over a crowd of 4,000 people, officially dedicated the opening of the Harbor Tunnel. The tunnel, actually two tunnels, two tubes, uh, cost $150 million dollars. They dip a hundred feet or more below ground and they involve a couple feats of engineering. To say that they were a big deal is an understatement. That's what we're going to talk about today. Have to start with a quick thank you to everybody who has donated to Baltimore Heritage. If you don't know who we are, we are a small two and a half staff organization and since 1960 our founding we've been helping Baltimore neighborhoods and historic places across the city. So thank you everybody who has helped us keep going on that mission. All right, Harbor Tunnel. Um, our tunnel was not the first automobile tunnel in the country. That honor goes to the Holland Tunnel underneath the Hudson River in New York, 1927 when it was, when it was opened. Uh, we weren't the first and we benefited by not being the first. In fact, we benefited in particular from the knowledge of the tunnel builders before us and specifically one gentleman named Ole Svingsted. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, Svingsted was a Norwegian-American engineer um, who had ended up leading the uh, uh, effort to complete the Holland Tunnel, and he was brought on to help us with our tunnel. Not only the Holland Tunnel, though, he helped build the Lincoln Tunnel in 1937, the Queens Midtown Tunnel in 1940, and the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel in 1950. If you wanted to build a tunnel underneath a body of water for cars, he was clearly the guy you wanted on your team, uh, and we were lucky to have him. Um, he got his start not with uh, car tunnels, though, but with train tunnels. He he worked for the Central Railway in New Jersey, uh, the Virginia Railway in Norfolk, and the Hudson Manhattan Railway in New York. Um, but building uh, tunnels for cars was fundamentally different than building tunnels for trains. And one of the main differences was getting rid of the exhaust and bringing in fresh air. These tunnels were a mile, maybe two miles long. Uh, and one of the goals of the engineers building them was not to asphyxiate the drivers. And how to do that was a challenge. It With the Holland Tunnel, in New York, many people thought that it couldn't be done, including none other than Thomas Edison. Sphinxstead, though, however, was undaunted. Undaunted, He said, well, let's try some experiments. He partnered with the U.S. Bureau of Mines. They had some experience with tunnels and shafts. And a couple universities, they built a 400-foot long tunnel. They filled it full of cars. They turned them on. And then they simulated different traffic uh, sort of experiences, a uh, rush hour, a traffic jam, etc. And then he filled it full of college students and found out what happened to them during those different experiences. Now, Sphinxstead was not evil. He also put in their monitors, uh, people with oxygen masks, presumably, to make sure the college kids got out all right. And they all did get out all right. But what he found at first was pretty discouraging, that if you had fans blowing at one end and fans sucking at the other end, you would have to create essentially gale force winds to get enough fresh air in there. But then that's when the light bulb went off. And Sphinxstead said, ha, aha, instead of maybe just having one tube, one big straw, let's have three straws stacked up on top of each other. The main tube would be for cars, but below it would be another compartment that could be hot pressurized and a lot of air forced through and then up through vents into where the car shaft was. And then above the car shaft was yet a third tunnel or a third tube uh, that would be, again, high pressure and it would suck out the carbon monoxide and the other noxious fumes. And so the genius that he had was that instead of having the air flow through the tube from one end to the other, it flowed through the tube from bottom up through the top. And it worked. Uh, with the Holland Tunnel, after the first couple weeks and a lot of monitoring, they found that the, uh, the carbon monoxide level inside the tunnel was about half that, even on the busiest days, was about half that of what you would breathe standing on the street corner in downtown Manhattan. So safer to be in the tunnel than outside of it. Um, that, of course, was the same technology employed in uh, the Holland Tunnel, in the uh, Harbor Tunnel, excuse me, uh, here in Baltimore. But Sphinxstead was not done innovative. 
innovating, he had to deal with what all engineers have to deal with when uh, working underwater, and that's how do you build something underwater. The traditional method had been using something called caissons, big boxes that were pressurized, full of air, sunk down to the bottom, creating a workspace for the people working on the tunnel in this case. The problem was that they were very expensive and very dangerous. Workers were getting sick uh, and even dying all the time from the bends and other injuries involved. So Sphinxstead's uh, bright idea was to essentially uh, dig out a big gully on the bottom of the Patapsco River and then from barges floating on top sink down big sections of the tunnel and then when they were all down in the mud in the bottom have divers, scuba divers, go down and bolt them together. Once they were all bolted together you could pump out the water, bring in the air and voila we have a tunnel. Um, it worked so well that that same technique was used in other tunnels, including one that I know many of us uh, love to drive on, and that's the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel that used that same trenching technique. All right, final words uh, before I uh, uh, hang up here, and that is who was the first person to go through the uh, tunnel when it opened up? And the first person, we know who it was, and it was a gentleman, a caterer out of a place called Teaneck, New Jersey, and his name was Omar Catan. Now, Catan wasn't just didn't just happen to be driving through Baltimore and uh, happened to be first in line when the tunnel opened. Catan was known as Mr. First in New York. He was the first person to buy a New York subway token. He was the first person to put a coin in a uh, New York parking meter. He was the first person to ice skate at Rockefeller Center. He was the first person to drive through the Lincoln Tunnel. Um, he had a strange hobby of being a Mr. First. He had a lifelong competitor in that, uh, if you believe it, and that was his brother. But apparently Omar was, uh, was king of Mr. First. Um, if you're curious, his last first was he was the first person in the late 1980s to drive on the newly opened I-595 highway uh, connecting the Fort Lauderdale Airport and the Everglades. Um, so back to 1957, Omar Catan had been waiting patiently for hours and hours, lined up first at the mouth of the harbor tunnel, waiting for the politicians to uh, get done with their speeches. And then when they finally got done with a grin on his face he happily paid the 40 cent toll and became the first person to drive through the newly opened harbor tunnel thanks so much and we'll see you next time